So today we're going to make this force field using a 2D shader. It's going to refract or change the light that comes in from behind it, and it also knows approximately where it is hit. That way the animation is a little bit different when it gets shot from different sides. So the first thing we're going to do is build this shield piece by piece with a shader. So this first shader is very simple. All it does is make a circle. So the first thing we're going to do in the fragment function is actually modify the UV. That way we can measure things from the center of the image. So that's just UV minus 0.5 because you remember that the UV is 0 to 1, and it typically starts in this upper left-hand corner. Next, we're going to measure the length of each pixel to our new UV, so every pixel measured to the center, and then we're going to find our alpha based on this smooth step here. So all this is saying is either it's going to be 0, so it'll be clear, or 1, so it'll be the white, or, and what we're measuring is the distance from the middle. If the distance is shorter than 0.4, so 0.4 of the way across the image, it will return 0, and if it's above 0.45, it will return a 1, which will make the alpha 1, and I just have the color set to white currently. So then we're going to make a grid of circles. Now instead of having the modified UV just be in the middle, we're going to have a local UV for each little section of this image. Now what each part of this is, is we need a vector 2, and it has an x and a y coordinate, and the fract is just going to take the decimal section of the UV. And what we're going to do is calculate the UV times scale. So what that does is, if this was 1, so we have the scale over here now, it doesn't really like to update when you have, when you update it in here now, you have to update it in the inspector sometimes. So if we only had 2 here, it only have 2 circles. Um, and so that's what the scale does when you multiply the UV by that, and you get the fract. Also, remember we have to center the circles. If we don't have this 0.5, it will put all of the circles centered in the upper left-hand corner. Again, to make the circle, we get the length of the local UV this time, and then we have a final alpha, just like before, we smooth step it. If we want to have different size circles, we just have to change this number to whatever you want. The greater the difference between these two numbers, the blurrier they will be. So if you want it to be real crisp, you could put it like 2.1, and you can have real crisp pixelated circles, or if you want it to be a little bit smoother, you could be 0.5. If you invert these numbers, like say this number is bigger, you'll end up with this type of grid. So moving on, we're going to mix the two of these into a waffle. So in this waffle, we're actually mixing these two. So we have the modified UV of this first one, and the local UV of the second one, and then we're going to measure the length of the large circle, we'll measure the length for each little circle, and then we'll multiply both of them together. So this grid distance means that this smooth step is for each grid circle, and this smooth step is for this greater circle here that goes around the edge. So if we wanted to make the circle smaller, we could just make it 0.3, so then the circle would be smaller, and again, the difference between these smooth step numbers is less than it was before, so it's a very crisp edge. If you don't want it to be a crisp edge, you make it smooth. So I had it 5. If you make these numbers different again, you can invert it. I don't know why you'd want that right now, just in case that's what you see. So what's happening here is when you multiply two smooth steps together, it basically merges the two images together. And again, our color is still just white, and this is just affecting the alpha. Okay, so we're going to go down here and add this second circle in. So again, this is all the same. We have our modified UV, our local UV. We're getting the distances for each. So I moved this down to the next line so you can see it. So the first part of this equation is exactly the same. Let me just cut this out. If the first number is smaller than the second number, then you get this whole here in the middle. If we add all that back in, if we merge all three of these images together by multiplying these smooth steps together, we get this waffle grid as a circle with 
a hole in the middle. Now, next we're going to warp it a little bit to make it look more spherical. So I upped the scale so the grid size is a little bit smaller, but overall it's basically the same thing. We have our modified UV so we can measure from the center. We have our local UV, which is a little bit more complicated now, and that's how we get this illusion of it being a sphere. And everything else is actually the same as it was before. So what's happening in this local UV? Well, first off, we can cut this out. And you can see that it's actually kind of pulsating back and forth. I wanted there to be just a little bit of movement. So this actually isn't necessary. And then that movement is gone. So that's all that that first part of the uh, equation is doing. So we'll paste that up there so we don't forget it. Instead of it just being the fract of the modified UV, we're going to multiply it by the length of the modified UV. So next I added in refractions. You can kind of see how it's distorting the Godot face icon behind it. Again, this is all the same. So to make our refractions, what we're going to do eventually is do a texture lookup of the screen behind the shield. So we have to calculate where we want each pixel of the shield to be looking on the screen behind it. So if we were just to look up the screen UVX and screen UVY, all that would do would be a perfect image of exactly what's behind it, and it wouldn't distort it at all. And if we only add the UV.Y to that screen UV, the only distortion we'll get is it will be upside down and kind of reflect it like water. But I don't actually want it to be upside down, and I want it to reflect when it's on top of it. So if we, if we add this UV height, it creates the effect that I would like. It's a little bit stretched, but you can still see what it is behind. We mix this color, which is a light blue, and the screen texture that we just calculated. And I have that pretty high right now, so you can see the refractions happening. But in the game, we'll probably actually have that closer to like 6 or something, so you can still see the shield. So this last example, what I went ahead and did is I added a shield color. That way I can just change the color of the shield really easily here in the side here and I have a damage color so the shock wave that we're going to send through you can see it a little bit right here you can also change the color of that easily okay now the shock wave parameters we're going to have the center which is where the shock wave is going to start the force is how much it's going to distort the things behind it the size is how large the ring currently is and the thickness is the thickness of the ring now the shock wave was heavily influenced by this guy nokaloid uh, he has some really good videos you should check him out but again we have all of the same information here at the beginning of the shader and we're going to go down to this shockwave calculation. So we're, we start off by calculating what the shield UV should be looking up, and we're going to add a mask of a shockwave to it before we actually mix our final color. So these are all of the new lines. So again, this mask makes this donut, just like before, how you multiply a larger smooth step by a smaller smooth step and you get a ring kind of like the overall shield that we have and the distortion is going to be this calculation here now nocaloid goes through this part pretty in depth so i'm not going to redo what he does but uh you should definitely check out his video if you want to know more about how this works then this line all it does is it adds this color into the ring of the distortion that is going through the shield. And again, at the very end, we mix all of these together. I actually multiplied the alpha by three just to make it pop a little bit more. If you don't do that, it gets it's a little bit dim and tough to see, or, and I wanted it to be a little bit more opaque. And then you have the final color. So now when we go back to our project, we have this enemy template that I have going through that I've gone over in previous videos which I'll put links in the description. But we have this shield, which is just a sprite. It, it literally is just the Godot icon. And we added this shader that we just went through. Um, I have it set to six for the mix. So the next step here is to figure out where we actually want the center of our shockwave to start. First thing that we're going to do is we're going to make an area 
and I have these collision polygons. Uh, I started in the upper left, and it's very important that you do these in the right order, or at least you match up the code later on to the order that you put these. So I started in the upper left, and then I went to the upper right, bottom left, and the lower right. And how you do these polygons, here I'll delete one, and we'll go ahead and add a polygon 2D. And you have to make sure that you're in the select mode to actually place these. But you can go ahead and place just a handful to give you the rough idea. It doesn't have to be a super detailed collision, but that will be the fourth collision in our shape. So typically, in most tutorials, you'll see that an area only has one collision shape, but you can actually have multiple collision shapes. And we have these different shapes, that way we can easily know where the bullet is coming from. So when we go and look in the code, if it enters this first section, we're going to move the center of the shockwave up here. If we hit over here, we'll move the center of the shockwave up here. Typically, when you add a signal, you use the area entered, because my bullets are going to be areas, and they're going to enter this area. But we're actually going to use area shape entered, which is going to give us a little bit more information, since we have multiple collision shapes. So the function that is connected to the signal of the area shape entered is right here. It has more information than what you typically would get in just an area entered. And the main part that we want is the self shape, all of these area ID, area, and uh, area shape pertain to the bullet that is hitting the shield and not the shield itself. The self shape is telling us what number of polygon is getting hit. So when this argument is 0, 0, it's going to be that first polygon that was in the upper left hand corner. And again, with the 1, it's the upper right hand corner. So you just have to match these vectors to the right quadrant. Now I picked 0.3 because if you remember the edge of the shield is 0.5 and I wanted the shockwave to start somewhat in the middle but I also wanted it to be very clear that it was in different sections when you hit it from different areas. Now obviously you could add more collision shapes but I was kind of worried about performance because I don't know how many enemies I'll actually have at a time and I haven't actually done any tests to see if collision polygon 2Ds are that much slower or if this approach is that much slower than just having a simple circle here as a collision shape. So then you have to set that shader param to the proper vector 2. And uh, obviously this is the upper left because you minus 0.3, minus 0.3, and you have to get your negative positives correct, otherwise it will not hit in the right spot. Then we play the shockwave animation, which I'll go over here in just a second, and I destroy the bullet. So the shockwave animation is very simple. I added a keyframe to the size parameter, and how you do that is you would go, we'll pin this and we'll go here, and you would click this little key when the zero, or we're going to set this first keyframe to zero. So you click the little key, then you come to the end, or the animation is only 0.6 seconds long, and this keyframe is 1.5, just to make sure that the circle actually goes all the way through, um, and you don't actually end up with just a little bit left over hanging on the edge. And what you would do is you'd click here, and well, the size is 0.5, you'd click this little key, and this other one, I changed the thickness a little bit. I don't know if it really changes that much. Basically, it starts off fairly thick, and then it goes to 0.1. So this is 0.3. This is 0.1. So it kind of dissipates as it goes through the shield. I do not have autoplay on, and it does not loop. Now, one problem you might run into is when you get shot, all of the, sh all of the shields look like they're getting hit. And how you fix that is one easy click, you go to your shield sprite, you have your your material, your shader open, and you go down to the resource tab underneath the shader params, and you click local to scene, and you just click that on, and it'll make each one unique. That way you don't have that problem. Okay, so obviously I could do a lot more with this, but I think this is good for now, and if you have any questions, please let me know, or any ideas of how to make it better, I'm always welcome to wonderful ideas.